called the fox and the chickens. On a farm anywhere, the fox awaits in the cover of the trees. He has been here many times before, so he, he knows that the chickens will get free. The chickens feel pretty safe within the comfort of their pen, but that old fox knows there are places where he can get in. But there is this big yellow dog that patrols the yard, so he knows that he's not safe as long as he is on guard. He is the voice of the chickens who will belt out the alarm that is sure to bring the master out with that old shotgun in his arm. The fox is the devil, and he's very shy. He'll tell you what you want to hear, but it will just be another lie. There will always be those that will go beyond what the master has allowed. And if there's ever a chance, that old devil will know how. The church is like a farm where many beautiful things are. And if an opportunity presents itself, then the fox won't be far. He is not afraid to come in an open door and sit amongst the pews. And he'll look for signs of weakness until he finds the damage he can do. Just like the chickens in the barnyard, there's a degree of safety within. But whatever the fox may bring, he will never be your friend. The fox and the chickens is just a story I have told. How it will affect your life will depend on how you let it unfold. The fox is always very uh, willing and able to, to come into this church. He's not afraid of the church. As long as people, as long as there's somebody in this church or any church that's not fully aware or weak, then he, the fox will know that. The devil is not going to stop coming after what he wants. So be, be vigilant, keep everybody in prayer, and have God's love. I was talking with a friend this uh, past week, and while talking with him, I went to my concordance. And a concordance in most study Bibles, you can find one. A concordance you can also buy by itself. A concordance is simply a book, uh, very, one would say very akin to a dictionary, albeit it has a, a slight twist than what a dictionary would have. A concordance gives you the number and the location and the information associated with a word in the Bible. So, for example, if you wanted to look up the word saved and you were looking through there, you would find multiple meanings and definitions of that word saved and then you would see where it's located throughout the Bible. So in my concordance, as I was studying and discussing with this friend, I then took a quick glance and at three words as they paralleled each other in, or I should say followed each other in my concordance, and it was like a light went off. And it's a simple phrase, but I think it to be very powerful. So God willing, I believe I am going to uh, speak on this uh, statement over the next several Sundays. It simply says this, as I was looking in that concordance, and it was in one of my Bibles, I have many Bibles, and uh, but in that particular concordance, some are thicker than others, and so some words are removed and others are added, depending on how much space they're going to take. 
So in my concordance, when I looked, I found these three words in this order, and this statement says, between salvation and saved was Satan. It would hold up true in any dictionary or any way because of the spelling of those three, those three words. But between salvation and saved was Satan. Right in the middle of those. And I thought, wow, how profound, how ironic, how neat, how challenging, how comforting. This is a that between salvation, which is salvation was done on the cross, and between the words saved and salvation, Satan was right in the middle of them. And so it challenged my heart, and I said, I'm going to preach on that. Between salvation and saved is Satan. So today I want to begin with that first word, salvation. I want to talk about it. It is almost an elementary, not even almost, it is an elementary principle. That means it's a grade level understanding of what salvation is. Because if we don't truly have a firm grasp, of the word. Now, in Christianity, we seem to, especially the longer that you've been a Christian, you throw out terms and they tend to be loosely used. That is, we say some things, we may not even fully understand what they mean, but we say, and then the world today, they have termed that Christian ease. Words that are so fluent to our language and so uh, paramount to our understanding that we use them just at a whim but in the world and in the context of a new believer and anyone that's an unbeliever these words mean nothing or at best they mean very little to them but for us who are being saved to us who are in the church to us who follow the rule and the reign of Jesus Christ we have to understand the true purpose of that statement between salvation and saved is Satan. Salvation. I started to define the word, and I will, but in addition to defining the word, let me put some additional words that mean or they fall in line with this word salvation. Hopefully it'll put it into a little bit clearer perspective. Salvation also being deliverance, to set the captive free. Another being forgiveness, to set the spirit free. Thirdly, reconciliation, to restore that which has been broken. Redemption, to reclaim and release. Regeneration, simply to renew. And lastly, rescue, to release that which is in bondage, in danger or distress. If we think of salvation in this understanding, it takes on a whole new light. Because if I were to poll uh, us gathered here today and said, oh, what does salvation mean to you? I have no doubt in my military mind, and I've been proven wrong here in the polls that I've taken at Hoover's Gap Church, that if I were to go around the room and say, what does salvation mean to you? We would probably end up with 20 different understandings of that same word. And that is okay, because just as I indicated, salvation has these additional meanings to it. So it is all of those things, yet it is one. So it's not bad to have an understanding here and here and here, but as long as we have the full understanding that they all make up this cookie. All, I was talking with a friend of mine. He loves to cook, and he said, you need to make uh, chocolate chip cookies with white ch chips and crushed up walnuts. I never had that, but at the time on the, on the phone call, I thought, man, I want some chocolate cookies. So just to know that it's a cup of that chocolate chip, whether it's white, chocolate, black chocolate, sweet chocolate, semi-chocolate, whether you put walnuts or pecans or whatever you put in that chocolate chip cookie, it's still all one cookie. So again, salvation can be within the same understanding. It's a deliverance to one, forgiveness to another, reconciliation for some, redemption and regeneration and rescue to release that which is in bondage, danger or distress. I did do the research and I found in my Bible that the definition of salvation in and of itself, when it's used as a noun, and I love this to put it into perspective, we, uh, I'm sure, understand what a noun is. That's probably the only English thing that I understand in regards to, say, an adjective, an adverb, or all these other things. So I would not pass those tests I'm sure you were talking about. 
God uses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. So I am grateful that I don't have an understanding. So then I have to go search it out. But the one thing I do know is a noun means a person, a place, or a thing. That's salvation. <laughs> Somebody didn't hear me this morning. That was an amen moment. Salvation in a noun form is a person, a place, and a thing. Right now, who is the person? The amen. Who is the person? Come on, it was a participation moment today. Who is the person of salvation? Jesus Christ. That is the person. Where is the place? No, sir, Calvary. There is but one place where salvation made its true mark, Calvary. If it would not have been for Calvary, everything we are talking about is in vain. Because on Calvary was the redemption made. On Calvary was the forgiveness allowed to us. On Calvary was that moment where the veil was ripped in half and it allowed normal people, well, you're not normal, but me normal, uh, allowed the normal people, that's a joke, you can laugh, it's okay. If you don't. For the normal people, he said, we are you know, strange and peculiar people, but for it allowed the common folk. Is that a little bit better for the South? It allowed the common folk, like you and I, to walk into that place of the Holy of Holies. It has afforded us that opportunity of reconciliation to God. Because we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and there is but one way to remiss in that sin, and that is through the blood shed for us. So without Calvary, it has nothing. So it's a noun, it's a person, it's Jesus Christ, it's a place, it's Calvary. And then lastly, it's a... Kenny, you about ready to get up here and preach for me, brother. You saw spit flying out of my mouth. It's the cross. A person, a place, or a thing. Salvation. Between salvation and saved resides Satan. Salvation, the forefront, the very first act that really brought us, the common folk, into a place that we had never been allowed before. We were excluded. My Bible, oh, I like what that one gentleman said, yo Bible, with a Y-O, and a yo Bible. Yo Bible says that salvation is of to the Jews. But then it was opened up unto us, the common folk. It's a noun. A person, a place, or a thing. And this is the definitional term. Deliverance from the power of sin and its consequences. The deliverance from the power of sin. I've heard it said that sin will take you further than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. We have been delivered from that power, that sin that so easily entangles us and trips us up. <laughs> I bought a new pair of boots one day. Uh, not boots as in Tennessee boots. They don't have any, you know, Tennessee boots. You just stick your foot in it and you go on down the way and you leave your pant leg pulled up over your boot. Who, who does that? Look. Stop looking at Jeff. He does that. Puts his foot in his boot and leaves the pant leg up. And, no, I'm talking about boots with laces. And, they, and I'm used to the military where they had quick laces, where they had eyelets and the shoe, and you just pull your strings and it gets tight. Well, these had open eyelets. So they have a little clamp. And I do a left over right. If, where's my military folk? I do left over right when I'm loose, lacing them up. And I put them on left over right. And I sat down in my chair and I crossed my legs like I always do, not even thinking twice, and had my legs crossed and doing my work. And somebody called and said, Raymond, come here. And I just pulled both my feet up and started to walk. And those loops had hooked from one leg to the other. And whoop, pow, down on the ground I went. The one loop hooked onto the shoestring of the other. And whew, I thought, okay, I don't, I'm not used to it. End result was I was all tripped up. I didn't mean to get tripped up. It was That's the power of sin. Sometimes when you're least expecting it, all of a sudden something just gets a hold of you and pulls you down and wham, down to the floor I went. It didn't keep me there, though. I got up, I laughed about it. 
And I figured out, all right, I won't have to cross my legs like that. I got to put my pant legs over my boots so they don't snag each other. And, but the power of sin is just like that. It wraps itself around our legs, sometimes aware. It might even have been a new pair of boots that you bought thinking you're doing right. And wham, they get hooked up and tripped up. The power of sin has been broken by salvation. It is up to us to walk in the fullness of that power. It is up to us to stand in the anointing and the belief of that power. It does not have hold over us. It has a hold on us, but it cannot hold you down. It's up to you. It's up to you and your faith whether you let that power wrap you up and keep you down. Now, I'll tell you the truth. It took an extra co-worker who heard me and heard me laughing, really. I don't know if they heard me fall, but I know they heard me laughing because they came over there and she literally had to take my foot and unhook it from the other. Sometimes we need help. Sometimes we need help. That power of sin and the deliverance from the consequences. Be known. The consequences is a powerful understanding of the law. The consequences of sin is one thing. Just one. Spout it out, Kenny, brother. The consequences of sin is death. Period. Oh, death, where is your sting? Victor, death, or hell, where is your victory? What's that scripture that says that power? There is but one consequence to sin, and it equals death. I heard the testimony of a gentleman who preached back in the 1970s, late 70s and early 80s, and he was sharing his testimony about what God had showed him in a supernatural vision at a time when he had uh, had a massive rupture of a vein inside of him and he was bleeding out and uh, so one of the what you call near-death experience one would call it. but in that testimony it is so powerful I hope to be able to edit it down and show it here over the next couple Wednesday nights not this Wednesday but the following but in that testimony it is so powerful in understanding because he said he died and he went and he saw that he was immediately encompassed by this great vast veil of darkness he said it was so dark you cannot even begin to comprehend it was so dark he could not articulate it well enough it was so dark that most people cannot comprehend the vast overwhelming feeling of blackness darkness Uh, i've been in places where it literally was so dark you could not see the hand in front of your face That had nothing, I believe, to compare to what this gentleman had seen. And then all of a sudden he said he saw one thing, just one thing. It looked like a sign. He said it was a ticker tape in his day. and that It was a sign spinning around and around and around and around. And he went to it and he finally he read it. And he said he saw himself reading it every time it circled around. And it said on there a single verse of scripture. It is appointed unto man once to die in judgment. The consequences of sin is death, period. Let's, let's, uh, let's turn it around just for a second. We've spoken about what salvation is in those other words, the other understandings, puts it in a little bit of perspective. We've understood the definition of salvation, although if we were to take a test, I doubt I could pass it or recite it, so I'll simply say it again. Deliverance from the power of sin and its consequences. So if we understand what it is, what's the opposite? What would be the opposite of salvation? According to my research, it's damnation. And it really, with the understanding of what the opposite of salvation was, then puts it into a light understanding in my conscience that puts it in this. The opposite of salvation is damnation, and that being the state of being in hell as punishment after death. The opposite of salvation is damnation, the state of being in hell as punishment after death. 
So if the opposite of salvation is that punishment which reserves us in hell and it happens after death, then where is salvation fully experienced? Is salvation fully experienced here? Is salvation fully experienced? If the opposite of salvation is the presence and the punishment in hell after death, the same holds true for salvation. Salvation will benefit you no good on this side of the cross. The salvation will benefit you no good this side of the grave. Salvation will do you no good this side of eternity. Because as long as we have breath and physical being in here, as long as we are on the green side of the grass, we have no benefit of salvation. That may shock some of your religious understanding, but it's true. We have to believe in we have to receive, we have to understand, and we comprehend that underst- what salvation is, but it is of vi- zero value to us. Like the joke I said the other day where the gentleman went to heaven and he was allowed to take his most prized possessions with him. And when he showed up in heaven, he opened up his suitcase with the most prized possession he had on this earth, and it turned out to be a bars of gold. And they looked at him and said, why did you bring sidewalk?" Why did you bring a street material? If your most prized possession is stuff we walk on, it's not going to benefit us on this side. On the other hand, let's talk about saved. Now, again, we have salvation, which was a person, place, or thing, which we have Jesus Christ on Calvary with the cross. And on the opposite end is saved. And we'll talk more about that next week, about what saved really is. What are we saved? from and what are we saved to and why even be saved between salvation and being saved is satan in that testimonial tape that i've listened to over and over again <laughs> he called he said it this way and the gentleman's name is howard o Pittman. and he said the devil is more than as we understood it in our time Because he said, in our church, we never talked about the devil. We never talked about Satan because he was a defeated foe. He said, we never understood what he was or why he was. He said, but I had found out in that single vision that I had of that single statement being tossed and turned round and round, he realized that Satan was more than old Slewfoot. Where's our older people? Bill Rusk. Oh, that's Slewfoot. That's what they called him, ain't it? The old Slewfoot, a defeated foe. He is the king of this world. He is that power of sin. He is the consequences. He is that. And it's more than just an old slew foot. I found in my Bible that word salvation appears 164 times, but mostly in two books of the Bible. In the book of Psalms and in the book of Isaiah. Now That was intriguing to me. Because I would have thought the word salvation would have been found mostly in the book of Exodus. The Exodus story of people being removed from such tyranny. The people who Moses led out from a king that was oppressive to the people. To me, it seems like they would have been the ones to the most to singing about and talking about and writing about salvation. But it wasn't. It was in the book of Psalms where they sing psalms and hymns and where through song about the works that have been wrought unto them. And in the book of Isaiah, I think I saw that simply because in the book of Exodus, they were going through it. In the book of Psalms, they were victorious over it. And in the book of Isaiah, they remembered about it. And just like it was then, in the book of Isaiah, they talked about it. So will it be here when death comes us? Then that's when salvation has its most meaning moment. Death. And it's at in the Nelson's Illustrated Bible B- Dictionary, it says this, and I quote, and I'll close with this. The need for salvation goes back to our removal from the Garden of Eden. After the fall, our lives were marked by strife and difficulty. Increasingly, corruption and violence dominated our world. And when God destroyed the world with the flood, he performed the first act of salvation by saving Noah and his family. The salvation of his family was viewed by the Apostle Peter as a pattern of a full salvation which we receive in Christ. The exodus of Israel from Egypt is another form of salvation for the people. 
But just as the Exodus symbolized their salvation, the captivity of the Israelites in Babylon was distrust uh, return to bondage. Even Israel's return from the captivity, however, failed to fulfill all their hopes. Salvation in Old Testament times failed to meet their expectations. God destroyed the world but saved Noah, a form of salvation. What happened after Noah was safe on the dry ground? First thing he did was built an altar and worshiped God. You can't go two more chapters down the road after that and find the sin that is running rampant on that world. He had wiped them all out, but sin grabbed, up, grabbed a hold of it. Same thing with the, in Exodus. They were saved right out of that tyranny and put into bondage even better than the first. Worse, I should say. Let me again say that the opposite of salvation is damnation. The state of being in hell is punishment after death. So then our faith and trust in the return of Jesus Christ is where our salvation's hope lies in wait. Salvation from hell and our redemption from death and forgiveness of sin is coming. When I wrote those words, I was immediately reminded of a song by Rich Mullins. Anybody remember Rich Mullins? It goes back, way back in the... Listen at me, way back. <laughs> it's not way back to some of y'all. He goes back just a bit to the 70s and the 80s. He sang a song that's titled, My Deliverer is Coming. Anybody remember that? My Deliverer is coming. He's coming. My Deliverer is coming. And he penned these words. Joseph took his wife and her child and they went to Africa to escape the rage of a deadly king. And they would sing on the banks of the Nile, My Deliverer is coming. In the book of Luke, so I can justify the ability to preach from the book of the Bible, in the book of Luke chapter 3 and verse 6, John is recorded as saying these words. That's Luke chapter 3 and verse 6. And it's John talking about the pre-coming of Jesus Christ and he says, all flesh will see the salvation of God. Amen. All flesh will see the salvation of God. The religious side of me says, stop, wait a minute. Salvation, I think, was at Calvary by Jesus on the cross. Isn't that just for the saints? that's been saved? How is it then that all flesh will see the salvation of God? Well, I'm glad you asked. Jeff, do you want to sing that song? No? Okay. Okay. All flesh will see the salvation of God. Every single eye will behold that gift that was granted and some of them, however, they're going to see it on this side or on that side. I have a bumper sticker that I had sent to my mother, and she liked it. And it said, eternity, smoking or non-smoking. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Eternity, smoking or non-smoking. And the, those who are saved understand the meaning of those words. But just like my Bible and your Bible explains to me that there's a divide there and it's a chasm that no man can cross but one is aware of the other. Every eye will behold salvation one day. Two reasons for that. One, because the Bible says it and I believe it true. And two, simply because I read that Bible and it shows me that illustration the rich man and Lazarus sitting there and he says, if you could but touch your finger in that water, for I'm quenched with thirst. And he could see the salvation of the glory on one side. And then the other on the other can see 
Every eye is going to see and behold that salvation. Trust me, everyone will see it. The question is, will it be smoking or non-smoking?